Yo, gracious greetings, St. Stephen family and guests. Welcome to another edition of Living Water for a Thirsty Thursday. I had to come back to the sanctuary and get down on this organ, this Hammond doing what it do, even though I don't know what I'm doing. But I uh, came out here because, you know, sometimes people listen to music and it sets a mood and it sets a tone. And, you know, a lot of times when you are in a relationship, you know, there's certain songs that you want to hear that remind you of that person or remind you of where you were and things of that nature. It just sets the tone. So uh, we're in the church house uh, because we want to set the tone and we're at the organ because we want to set the tone. And if you've been here, uh, you know, we've been walking through uh, these top five struggles that we have in our life. And today uh, we're moving down to that third one and it is relationships. The struggles that we have with relationships. I really wanted to speak about it from a few different perspectives, but before I do that, I want to read a familiar passage in 1 Timothy 4, 12, and it says, Let no man despise thou youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, but it ends with in purity and in purity that's in in chastity and making sure that we have cleanliness uh, some of you may have been around when we used to have something called true love waits and what it was was a call for young people especially to hold on to their virginity until marriage and what we found with the, the fallacy with that was is we didn't go far enough into talking about sexual purity. We actually talked about abstinence and not having that uh, sexual intimacy, you know, producing children. But we didn't say, hey, keep yourself sexually pure, which is going to that next level. And so when we talk about relationships, whether it's in the Bible or in our world, in corporate, in the military, uh, just societally speaking, like we we're saying, our relationships have been a stumbling block for people since the beginning of time. And when I say relationships, I'm speaking about it in a few different categories, I'm speaking about the relationships in a marriage and speaking about the relationships that we have when we're dating. And then also speaking about relationships that are inappropriate, inappropriate relationships. And we'll start backwards and move forward inappropriate relationships. So remember, as we are talking about this, we're talking about what can I tell someone that has a struggle with a relationship or more specifically in this case, what can I tell someone that's struggling with an inappropriate relationship? And especially if they're a believer, just like we were saying here, that let no man despise thy youth, whatever age you are, it doesn't matter. It says, but be you an example. And one of the things you can say to that person is be the example, uh, do things the right way. Uh, know that uh, what you do and what you don't do can influence other people. It can hurt other people and it can help other people. So let them know if they are in an inappropriate relationship, be thou an example, be an example of what? Of a believer. And if we are believers, what are believers? Believers are followers of Christ. What are followers of Christ? We are imitators of Christ. And what are we imitating? Well, Jesus Christ was perfect, right? And so just that subtle reminder that we need to be an example. And then it says, but do this in word, in conversation, you know, how we talk, how, what we say uh, is it, very important in, in our love, in our charity. And then it says in spirit and using the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and in our faith, because sometimes it's our lack of faith that has us going into areas that we shouldn't or linking up with things or people that we shouldn't. Inappropriate relationships. Help them to be an example. And then what about dating? Dating is another relationship that if we're not careful, it can get us. And in this day and age, there are all kinds of dating. There's online dating. There's all these different websites and uh, different apps and things that people can subscribe to uh, to meet people and never leave the comfort of their home. And, you know, they're chatting and they're talking. And the first thing they'll say again, how is your conversation? What are you saying? What are you typing? I know the profile is important. And I'll start off with just be honest with your profile, whether it's what you look or what your value system or what your worldview is. Uh, put it right in tight right off the bat. And that will help you 
to not have some type of foul relationship because it's not starting on false pretenses. So just being open up front. And then you say, well, I may not get as many people calling or checking or, I don't know, DMing or whatever it is and how they connect in those different um, websites or apps that we use. But I'd, I'd rather have few that are closer to what I'm looking for than sifting through a whole lot that I'm not really looking for. And so again, we're trying to look at how these relationships don't become stumbling blocks for us. And that's one way to do it. Uh, the next thing is where you go and what you do. You know, obviously you don't come back to your home. You don't open up your home. Uh, you don't, you make sure you go to public places at earlier times on those first dates, you know, literally go out and go to a date where it's an afternoon, right? Or it's a morning. That's where you want to spend that time as opposed to that time being something in the evening, which sets a different tone or a different atmosphere like the music. Uh, you're tired at that point. Maybe you have worked all day, whatever the case, you don't want to do that. Again, we're talking about how to date and have a healthy relationship. Uh, then when you have that first date, don't roll in on the big stuff, right? You don't have to like check off all the boxes. Just get a sense of, you know, is this person light, airy, cool, legit? you know, up front, you don't have to roll with, right, you know, how many kids you have, da, 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 and give them the ninth degree, just kind of relax. And, and then after an hour or two, maybe in that same time, if it goes there, great. But what I would say, less is more, try to set that first date up for no more than about an hour. Just get some generic information and then end it and walk away. You know, it's, it's, it's just a good thing. You don't get all heavy and people jump to conclusions too quickly. Uh, just just some things. And then, of course, going into those forbidden areas, right? The, the conversations that you don't want to have. If someone's automatically talking about things that are inappropriate and we're just now dating, we just now started talking, you already know this is probably not where we want to be. This is not what we want to do. If your worldviews aren't lining up, uh, it's probably not the person and it's probably not the time. And so cutting it off clean and early is better than waiting until your emotions get attacked, which leads me to the last thing, but is the most important thing. No missionary dating. You've probably heard that term before. Uh, if you're picking up pretty quickly from whatever's in their profile or other things that you're a believer, but they're not a believer, uh, it's cool if you want to lead them to Christ, but be a missionary. But don't be a missionary that's also trying to date that person. So if you're going to be a missionary, be a missionary. But don't let your emotions get involved and then also date that person. So if she isn't saved, then be a missionary. Keep talking to her. Lead her to Christ. If he isn't saved, be a missionary. Lead him to Christ. And then they can become someone that's a potential for you to date. Don't date and then say, now let me do what I can to lead them to Christ. Or I've already lost my witness because we've said or done things that I know we shouldn't have said or done. And so now I have no credibility in my witness uh, these are things that become our stumbling block. Lastly, the marriage is in relationships and, and a tool, a resource for them. And I'll just keep this one short and sweet. I mean, obviously, these same principles apply that as a married person uh, in your word, conversation, in your love, in your spirit, in your faith, in your purity, all of that speaks to um, a person that has a husband or a wife as well. But I'll say these five things really quickly for those in marriage. Here's the first thing that you want to use this as an inventory to say, man, if some of these things are a challenge in our marriage, we need to work on them. And then obviously, uh, if one of these things is a challenge in our marriage, we want to work on them. But these are the five things you should always be looking at to make sure your marriage uh, is where it needs to be and that these areas are healthy. Now, this isn't an absolute list. This isn't a perfect list. This is just a list that over the years developed, developed that uh, using premarital counseling. Number one, uh, what we've already talked about, that you both know God. Now, when I say know God, I don't mean that you have individual relationships, but that you actually use God in your relationship, that you pray together, that you read scripture together, that you seek God for guidance of what we're going to do with our finances, what we're going to do with our children, what we're going to do uh, on our vacation, even that we seek God as a couple uh, to discuss those things societally, things that are going on, that we look to God and we uh, convene with God, convene with God to help us with choices and decisions. Uh, so that's in essence, it's not two believers. That's that's not enough to say we're equally yoked. That yoking also comes from us 
working and serving together for the cause of Christ. So God being that big piece. Next, communication. Not that we talk or don't talk, but that we have healthy communication, that we're both good senders and that we're both good receivers. And if you are not uh, trying to do what you can to increase that communication. And so men, you may end up having to talk about some things that really aren't in your wheelhouse, but just so that you can have a more lengthy conversation with your bride, it's worth it. Women, you may have to do the exact same things that you didn't really want to discuss just to have the conversation. It's just like I used to tell kids a long time ago that didn't like to read, especially a lot of boys. Then I'd get them to find some magazines about things that they do like cars or planes or whatever and say, read that article. And they enjoy the article, but it got them to reading. So uh, that's what we have to do with our spouses to increase that communication and make sure what you're sending is also what they've received. So a lot of times bad communication is simply miscommunication. And, you know, sometimes the longer you know each other, it works even more against you because you think you know where that person is going and you're predisposed before they even finish their statement. And sometimes that's not where they were going, which leads to misunderstanding uh, rather than just bad communication. So uh, definitely starting with a God and communication is huge. Next one is finance, money. And it's not whether you have money or you don't have money, but having a conversation and understanding that typically in a relationship, there's a spender and there's a saver. Uh, if you're both spenders, then, you know, we need to talk about this and put some barriers in place that keeps us from spending all of our money. If we're both savers, we need to do some things to make sure that we build in some spontaneity so that we actually do also spend some money and enjoy our life. Uh, and if we're spenders and savers, giving each other room to know both need to exist. There's some money we need to spend. There's some money we need to save. And then sometimes uh, having someone that will bring up the conversations about investments and retirement. Uh, those are critical conversations that we need to have that we are looking into some type of investment and we are looking into some type of retirement and preparing for the person down the road. So hopefully you got those three. The next one is romance and romance is not the bedroom. Romance literally is everything outside of the bedroom that leads to the bedroom. And so it's a note. It's a thank you. It's a good morning. It's a you look nice. It's I missed you. I love you. I want you right. All of those things are, if not more important than what actually happens in the bedroom. Matter of fact, uh, a lot of times it's hard to get into the bedroom without these things happening prior. And so, again, we're talking about how to have these healthy relationships. And it, it really is that. And then the number one issue typically when it comes to romance with couples is it's not discussed. Uh, this younger generation, they talk about a little bit more than the older generation. But uh, talking about desires and it's much better to speak about things in positive than in negatives. So I like it and I enjoy it when you do this, not saying I don't like when you do, you know, that no one really wants to hear that. Right. So uh, just saying those encouraging positive things. And basically, you know, I would really enjoy if you did more of this. Right. People can respond to that much better than the negative side of that. So, again, the number one thing with romance is simply to talk about it. Uh, don't let it be this sacred cow that sits off to the side. And then lastly of this five legged stool, I would say that we're talking about is external family. And that's the role that they do or do not have in your house. You know, you you have cousins, you have brothers, you have uh, parents, you have all these people that may want to be a part of that, that circle. For an instance, uh, you as the spouse, uh, as a wife may say, you know, if somebody in my family, my cousin or my brother has an issue, then we always have a room open for you. But your husband may say, I didn't grow up that way and they can't come in our house. But here we'll give them some money so that they can stay at a hotel as long as they need. But I don't want them in the house. Well, you got to be able to find some middle ground. Uh, other things are parents. You know, they have their influence. If you're sharing information about the marriage and you're telling them, then they're giving you feedback and all those things. And again, it can cause some tension. So the role that you're going to allow external people to your nucleus pouring into your marriage is also important. So I know I've covered a lot of things here, talking about marriage, talking about dating and talking about these inappropriate relationships. But relationships, as we said, uh, it's a major struggle uh, for so many of us in one of those facets or a couple of those facets or maybe all of those facets. And so 
uh, working through some of these techniques that we talked about. And of course, 1 Timothy 4.12 can serve you well. Well, do you know which one we have next for next week? Hopefully you remember. Continue to make God proud in all you say, think, and do. Thank <laughs> you.